Revelation chapter number 16. Begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, pour out the vials of wrath, of the wrath of God upon the earth. And I will stop there if you remember last week. Two weeks ago, the angel was sent out in a cloud to reap the vine that had the grapes on it, right? The voice out of the temple said, go get it because it's ripe. Then, later on in that chapter, those grapes were thrown into the winepress of God's wrath, okay? Then it said it was trodden without the city. Okay, well, that wine press was to take grapes and turn them into grape juice in Bible days. Okay, some filthy people over in Europe used to stomp on them in a big barrel, right? Some people were smarter than that, and they had a contraption that you'd walk around it, and it was a giant screw that would press a plate down into a barrel. And then out the side, grape juice would come out. And you'd press it until it couldn't press no more. Right? You made sure that you got every last drop that you could out of them grapes. Well, God didn't cast those grapes from chapter number 14 into the wine press just to squeeze the juice and let it drain all over the ground. No, He collected it. Every last drop. And every last drop of God's wrath was poured into these seven vials that are given to these seven angels. We already read that part. But now, in chapter number 16, verse number 1, the great voice out of the temple said, Go pour out the wrath in those seven vials. Verse number 2, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped, the image, or worshipped his image. Now we don't get much to go off of of what was in this first vial, but it was something that would afflict men it said it was noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Now what's something that's noisy and it's going to grieve you to no end? Well, if you're me, it's somebody that walks around with their phone on speakerphone at the supermarket and talk out loud in public. Okay, that drives me up the wall. Okay, it's people that have their turn signal on for 19 miles and driving slow, and I think, oh, they're just looking for the right way. No, they're just slow, and they forgot they had the turn signal on. Okay? Right? But you have to think what's noisome, what's grievous. We don't know. The Bible doesn't give us much detail on this. But we know that it's so noisome, right? It's not like one of them white noise machines that some people use to go to sleep at night, right, to drown out everything else. It's not background noise. This is something that's going to be ever-present and unavoidable. Okay, y'all know the first Wednesday of the month around here, what happens? Storm sirens go off. Okay, if you've lived around here long enough, you may be able to ignore it. You just think, some people don't even hear them anymore. But if you live or you work right next to one of them suckers, you know when that thing kicks on. Right, you know, it's the first Wednesday of the month. Oh, they're just testing them. Not an issue. Well, imagine something so loud that it's not just an inconvenience. According to the Bible, it's grievous, sore. Meaning it doesn't just grieve them, it grieves them to no end. It grieves them to the point that it's ruining their life that that noise is around. What's that wrath? That God pours out, I don't know. But maybe when God pours that out, each and every one of them are going to hear something that reminds them of every time they heard the name of Christ and rejected it. I don't know. Maybe it's just a cry that says that the beast and the dragon and the prophet and all those that accepted the mark are damned. Whatever it is, it's not just noisy. It's so noisy that it ruins their lives. It's sore because it's so grievous to them. It causes them pain, maybe not physical, but certainly mental, emotional. It's something that they can't escape. Because when you pour out something upon the whole earth, 
it says in verse number one doesn't say pour out the vials upon part of the earth or only on the followers of the beast it says no, pour it out on the whole earth not going to be able to escape it and in verse number two or verse number three sorry the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea now it doesn't say that every living animal every living fish every living creature it says every living soul now the earth is going to look a whole lot like this we've already talked about all them seven seals being open right the face of the Lord was removed I mean the, the veil between us and the Lord was removed they could see his face they run to the caves well some of them may have run to the sea we know that at one point all the grass is consumed what are they going to eat well if there ain't no grass all the things that eat grass are going to die you might have to go out to the ocean but every living soul that's out upon the seas boat whether it's a cruise ship whether it's a, one of the antichrist's party ships right? whether it's an oil tanker everybody that's out on the water dies in an instant and in the third angel verse number four very similar it says and the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood and I heard the angel of the waters say thou art righteous O Lord which art and wast and shall be because thou hast judged thus so the second angel pours out his vial and it says that the seas became as the blood of dead men what's that mean? it was turned into blood then the third angel comes pours out his upon the rivers and the fountains of water what's that? that's everything inland everything that doesn't connect to the ocean it says and they became blood so within two vials all the water drinkable or non-drinkable all the water that had any ability to give them life has now been turned into blood then there's an angel of the waters which said thou art righteous God he says thou art righteous because you have judged this way we find out why in verse number 6 for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy and I heard another out of the altar say even so Lord God Almighty true and righteous are thy judgments they are as you'll remember two weeks ago we talked about those grapes on the vine that's not the true vine that was the vine of God's wrath and God through long suffering through patience through love and grace and mercy had not reaped that vine until he told the angel to go and get it so what has been stored up in that vine all those that came and proclaimed thus saith the Lord that were made martyrs that were executed that were persecuted that were criminalized for saying what thus saith the Lord the blood of all of those prophets it's still on the hands of those that shed it but this is the final culmination of the spirit that caused all of the prophets and all of the saints that were martyred to be martyred the antichrist right is the final culmination of the spirit of antichrist the spirit of antichrist has been around since the garden since before the garden when Lucifer was cast out of heaven and took a third of the angels with him the spirit of antichrist comes to full fruition during the great tribulation because God allowed it to be so and every person upon the face of the earth that isn't a part of the 144,000 and is still alive at the time that these vials were poured out are 100% in line behind and backing the antichrist they've taken either his number 
or his mark into their hand or into their forehead. They've persecuted those that would not sign up and line up with what the Antichrist's agenda was. And as the fruits of their previous labor, God doesn't just give them the blood of those that they've shed, but all the blood that the spirit of Antichrist has shed since the beginning. I firmly believe that part of that blood that will be poured out, that they'll be made to drink, that they'll have to reap for what they've sown, I believe it goes all the way back to Abel. Because what was Cain's spirit? It's not what God wants, it's what I find acceptable. That's the same spirit that Lucifer had within himself. It's not what God wants to glorify in heaven. I should be the one to be glorified because of all the music that I produce in heaven. Without me, there would be no worship for God, so I should be worshipped. It's the same spirit. That the essence of sin, which is what Lucifer was guilty of, is you've heard our pastor preach it, my right to my claim to myself. And that mentality and that mindset has shed the blood of countless. I mean, we'd be here until the end of time, and we still wouldn't know all, because not all of them were re recorded. But God's got a record of every one. And it's recompense, not only all the water that's inland, all the water on the face of the earth becomes blood. Now, I don't know if you know this, you can live drinking blood I know ooh, but I'm saying you can your doctor's not going to recommend that it's not the first option first option would be water and not polluted water good water but if there is no water you can do it it's not going to be enjoyable but every drink that they take Every dish that they go to cook, where they have to use that as one of the ingredients, they get that metallic, irony taste that reminds them, we deserve this. While whatever noisome pestilence that's driving them insane is still going on, robbing them of their false sense of peace that they had with the Antichrist. If he's all-powerful, how come he can't make the noise stop? If he's all powerful, how come he can't take the waters and turn them from blood back into water? Well, it says in verse number 8, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. First, you see that God attacks their mind. The first wrath shows that God's more powerful in than what's inside of you. You don't even know your own heart, the Bible teaches us. It's deceitfully wicked. You cannot know it according to the Word of God. You may have some understanding of it, but you'll never truly know it. And God robs them of all inner peace. Then he takes the very thing. Y'all do realize that before God said, let there be light, water was on the face of the earth. Because you go back over to Genesis 1, you'll find that the Spirit, capital S, moved upon the face of the waters. That water has been, a long, or been around longer than light has. How long has it been there? I don't know. I just know that in the beginning was the heaven and the earth. It's already here. God made it before he made light. That water is ancient. You study it out, water can neither be destroyed or created. It's the water cycle. If you believe that, and if that is true, that's the way that God intended it to be, which all evidence points that it is, you're drinking the same water today that he put on the earth before he made light. It's always been water. 
One constant in the history of man is that man flourishes where there's what? Water. If you don't have water, you're not going to last too long. Left to the elements, you're going to last about three days, is what they tell us. That's in best case scenario. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? First, he takes the thing that they thought was theirs their peace, their mind. It's grieved sore by this noisome plague. Then he takes the one constant that has always been here since the beginning, before the beginning. It was in the beginning that the earth was made. The water was already here. What's he do? He takes all water. You'll remember when the seals, it talked about a third of the water and a third of the creature of the seas. Now it's all water turned to blood. Not bitter. You could still drink it. But it disgusts them every time to realize that the one thing they thought could never be changed. Water. All of it's been changed. Then, this one, the sun. Now people are scared of the sun. Right? People walk around with tons of suntan lotion on. Right? I don't go crazy with it. But you do see that I can make the argument for the palest person in the room, okay? That's no secret. It's been so long since my legs have seen the light. They're not just white, they're neon white. <laughs> I have to get a letter from the government that says it's okay to wear shorts because they're like a health hazard for other people. If light hits them, you go blind if you look at them, <laughs> right? I'm white. Okay, I'm pale. Right, now that the red beard grew out, I'm like, ah, oh, that kind of makes more sense now. Like, this part not, but this part, okay, that makes sense. But see, for me, if I go out in the sun for any extended period of time without it, I'm going to come back looking like a lobster. I'm not going to be pale no more, I'm going to be red. And I've been scorched a few times just by a normal sun. Okay? You want to see something funny? go ask Christian if he still got the photos from the one cruise where they told me it was going to be a 30 minute kayak trip and I took suntan lotion for 30 minutes and we was out there for like two hours okay it wasn't that good I was walking around the room like this afraid to touch stuff hurt to lay down hurt to breathe right, don't feel sorry for me I was dumb okay like I'm talking the kind of sunburn where you blister after right Anybody that's ever had that, you know how bad that feels. Right? And because it's a part of your skin, anytime the skin moves, it hurts. Because it's been scorched. Now imagine, but that's in the modern world, where by the grace of God, He gave us this thing called ozone. Right? Which keeps the worst of it from actually getting to us. That we've got this stuff called SPF. Sun protection factor. Where if you put on a higher one, less of it gets through the actual skin. Here, all bets are off. God pours out His wrath upon the very sun and gives power over the sun to this angel that had that vial. And it says, verse number 9, that men were scorched with great heat. It wasn't that hot out when I got sunburned. I could go out there. I might be able to go out there today and get a sunburn if I really tried. Okay? Not hot that does it. Nowadays, it's the UV, right? Well, here it'll actually be the uncontained heat of the sun. God's going to turn the dial up on the whole planet. The very light will cause you not a sunburn. It will cause you actual burns. And it says, they were scorched. I don't know about you. I've been burned a few times. Not sunburned, like burn burn. Okay? My latest one was because of stupidity. And now I have a check mark on my hand. And if people ask me why, I get to say, that's God's stamp of approval. Why don't you have one? Okay? It all worked out in the end. But I, it, I was a sworn enemy of the old oven 
right? The oven and I did not get along. And one day the oven got me, and then I, I wanted to throw it out of the window, but I got vetoed on that decision, okay? That one healed. It went away. Now, that's not what scorched is. That's burnt. If you get burnt, you can heal. If you get scorched, you're permanently that way. Something that is scorched doesn't look like what it used to look like. When I got burned, it still looked like skin. It was just burnt skin. Okay, my hand was still able to function. If you scorch something, it means you char it. It means that you consume it. It means that it was burnt through. Now, I've never been so sunburned that the inside of me got burnt. But I've got a feeling that's what's going to be happening here. Right? The heat, the fire of their rage consumed the Son of God, consumed the followers of God. And now what? God's turning the heat up on them. Then it says in verse number 10, the fifth angel... I'm sorry, we missed something. Verse number 9. They've about been driven crazy because of this grievesome or grievous, noisome plague, judgment, wrath that God poured out upon the earth. Then God turns all the water to blood. Then, right, they're getting eat up by the sun all the time. Well, then, end of verse number 9, it says, And they repented not to give him glory in fact instead of just being stubborn and saying we're not going to repent go up a little bit they blasphemed the name of God they doubled down they said there's nothing that he can do to us that we can't stand so then God says okay why do they believe that because they still believe in the beast the one who had the head wound that healed from it so they're still thinking, we're scorched, but if he had the power to heal himself, he can heal us too. So then, in the fifth plague, verse number 10, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains, their sores, and repented not of their deeds so God with his fifth pouring out of wrath pours it out on the seat or the place of power of the beast meaning that all those that are under his authority are affected it starts at the top and it goes down to everybody else that was in line with him and it says his kingdom was full of darkness now, can you imagine the insanity that it would cause you to walk outside, it being completely dark, but you're still being burnt by the sun? He took the light away. He didn't take the sun away. He didn't take the heat away. They're walking in complete darkness. They've got to live their lives in complete darkness. Not knowing what's safe from sunlight and what's in sunlight. Not knowing where the sun is at in its trajectory across the sky because they can't track time anymore. You do realize that these watches that we all wear, it comes down to a whole bunch of math that is derived from how long it takes our planet to spin around one time and how long it takes our planet to go around the sun one time that's where it's all derived from but when you lose that calibration when you don't have scientists sitting in some you know deep locker somewhere in a, in a mountain somewhere where they're like this is the official clock and it will always be right but when all of that's been trashed or forgotten or they robbed it of anything useful and then everybody lined up with the beast they don't even know what time of day it is anymore 
Can you imagine thinking that you're walking out into safety and then you walk out into bright sunlight? It's not bright, but it's bright enough to scorch you. They start losing it. You don't believe me? Look at verse number 10 again. Kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. It's easy to dodge something where you know where it's at. If you're not in sun, sun cannot scorch you. But when he takes away your ability to know where you are and when you are, then any turn could be a grievous, to borrow the term from the first vial, could be a grievous awakening. And they're in so much pain from what's already come, not to mention what their bodies are doing on the inside with a solid diet based of, you know, blood-based food because they have no water. But their bodies are not just beginning to fail, they're beginning but to literally be consumed by God with the heat from the sun. It says that they gnawed their tongues for pain and blessed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Those are two different things. Pain is something that's recent. Let's see, for those of you that don't know, before I had back surgery, my lower back is still not good, but it's better than what it was. Because I was dumb and in high school thought that it would be impressive if I played football and lifted lots of weights and, ooh, big caveman, right? That's where the back pain started because it slipped a disc. And then it just kept getting worse. It's not ever going to get better. And then it got to the point that my brother bought a stupid 9 million pound desk off of Facebook that he wanted to put in his new house and we had to move it upstairs. Okay? Thing made of solid wood. And what happened? I was pulling on a dolly and then at one point I pulled and my back went instead of the desk. But we still got it up them steps. Right? Even with that chronic problem, pain was something that was new. Right? Pain happens because of something happening right now. Right? Every time that disc in my back bumped up against that nerve, it was pain now. If I could find a place to sit or lay or twist myself into a weird position to where disc wasn't touching nerve, no pain. Pain goes away. Pain is a problem of the present okay if you kick something and you break your toe when does pain happen when you step on broken toe if you don't step on broken toe less pain right pain is a now problem something that is sore or a sore is something that is a past present and future problem Okay, sores are something that starts small and get bigger. Sores are something that started and it wasn't as bad, but as it gets worse, it starts eating things. It starts infecting other things. It starts spreading throughout your body. Imagine gangrene. That was a small infection that turned into a large sore. Okay, something similar ingrown toenails. Anybody ever had them? You know how that starts? With just a little bit of pressure. And then that pressure turns into a little bit of inflammation. And as long as that toenail keeps digging in, it's going to cause more irritation. That irritation turns into a sore. And then that sore can become infected. And then if left untreated, that infection can spread to bones and to other tissue. And then the next thing you know, it's all the way up your leg. Sores are something that, yes, they're sore right now. They cause pain. But pain, you can mask. You can disguise. You can try and get away from pain. You can do things to make the pain stop. But something that's sore, it doesn't matter how you lay. It doesn't matter if you're standing, if you're sitting, if you're laying down. If you're sore, you're sore. 
But if you get up and you go out and you do a hard day's work, when you hit the bed, you cannot move. And breathing may be the only thing that doesn't cause you pain, but your whole body is sore all over. Imagine that, but to a degree you've never experienced before. How bad is that pain? How bad are those sores? They start chewing or gnashing upon their own tongue to try and dull the pain of everything else. Anybody ever hear that phrase like, hey, this is going to hurt, so bite your finger? Right? There is some truth to that. Your brain can only process pain in one place at a time. So they try to inflict so much damage to their very tongue. Why don't they try something else, Brother Jordan? They're so sore, right, that they're incapable of movement. They can't get up and cause pain in a different way. All they can do is move their tongue and bite down on it, trying to alleviate the pain. And it says, even though they're gnawing their very tongues out, they still blaspheme God and will not repent, the following after the Antichrist. Then in verse number 12, it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared now this wrath is not something that directly inflicts or impacts man this is a wrath that paves the way for man's very destruction that river Euphrates you go and look at it it's a major boundary between the valley of Armageddon and where a lot of these armies that are going to be coming to the battle are actually going to be headed from. What's God do? God just makes a little highway for them. Says this is going to be the easiest way to get there. Then in verse number 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouths of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For these are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God, Alm God Almighty. Here's what they say. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they shall see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The sixth wrath is having men forget all of their divisions and all of their hesitancies or all of their obligations to where they're from or the people that they love. God pours out a vial and everyone is committed 100% to going down to a valley called Armageddon. They say, it's time for our last hurrah. We got one last shot at this. We're all in on getting to that place. They're deceived by the three unclean spirits, the spirits of devils that come out of the prophet, the beast, and the dragon. They're beguiled into it, but just like Eve, they decide to become partakers in Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. What was done? All seven vials had been empty. God's wrath had been poured out. In verse number 18, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. This vial is poured out into the very air. We, don't, again, don't hear what these voices and thunderings and lightnings are, but they're so powerful or they say unto the earth, right, it's time to disjoint yourself. Or because of the authority that God gave to those voices, the very earth breaks. You say, but I thought you said it was an earthquake. It's, a, it's an earthquake, but it's not an earthquake. If this is an earthquake, anything that man's ever experienced, right, was just a bouncy house. 
How bad is this earthquake? Verse number 19. The great city, that's Jerusalem, was divided into three parts. It splits. It doesn't say that, you know, just no crack. No, no, no. It says it divided it. It not attached anymore. You can't just get from here to there anymore. Then it says, and the cities of the nations fell. It's talking about great cities raised flat to the ground. Then it says, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. We'll get to that later. And every island fled away. You ever seen an earthquake so bad an island disappears? All of them disappear in this one. Then it says, And the mountains were not found. Now they say earthquakes happen because mountains are coming up together. Or land masters are trying to pull apart from each other. Or they're trying to slide past each other. God got rid of them all. God took everything. If it was out in the ocean, He buried it under the water. If it was on dry land, on one of the main continents, God makes it flat. No more mountains. Then it says, verse number 21, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Again, remember, he poured his wrath into the sky. The sky is what made the noise that caused the earth to break. And then, once it's flattened, once all the islands disappear, hail starts coming out of heaven. Except this ain't hail. These are meteors. You can say, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? It says that every hailstone had the weight of a talent. Well, depending on which definition you use, in the Old Testament, a talent of silver or of gold was a measurement size. And it was a giant sack, is what it was. It wasn't just a talent that you could walk out and hand. It wasn't a coin. But even if it was a coin... You ever hold a solid gold coin in your hand before? It got some weight to it. Now imagine it's a terminal velocity coming out of the sky. But I'm more of the opinion that the weight of a talent is that measurement. They may not be large, but they're heavy. Or they may be large and heavy. But if you get hit by one of these things, it doesn't just ruin your day, it ruins a lot. If it doesn't outright kill you, you're going to be a whole lot different afterwards. You're going to walk different, you're going to talk different, you're going to look different. And it says, verse number 21, that men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. This wasn't just a few pieces of hail that fell down. It's hail all the time. Everywhere. And there aren't any mountains. And if there aren't any mountains, there aren't any caves in the mountain. It's all flat. You've got nowhere left to run. But in verse number 19, it says, And great Babylon came in remembrance before God. Meaning that God had set everything else out and now it was time for him to deal with Babylon. Notice Babylon, capital. And what's God purposed to do to Babylon? To give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. God took one cup and his fiercest wrath he put into that cup. Didn't pour it into the seven vials. The hardest pill to swallow he has in a cup, and he has on that cup the name Babylon. Reserved for one person. Well, when we get down to it, 
in the next chapter, I want you to remember that Babylon, God reserved his fiercest of his wrath for. Because next week, we're going to get into chapter number 17. Somehow we managed to get through all of that. And next week, we find out about mystery Babylon. Spoiler. Babylon is, if you want to identify it, it's not a religion. It is the spirit that drove so many false religions. We can identify the maybe the biggest piece that's still around today. That would be called the Catholic Church. But Babylon is all of the false religion that had the mentality of we'll kill that and silence that so that we're the only ones around and we can be right. We'll make ourselves rich. We'll use that richness to influence men and then we will corrupt the message of God and pervert it into something that's completely different. There's a whole lot of people around the world that aren't Catholics that believe a whole lot of wacky stuff about Jesus. But yes, Catholicism as a whole has been a major driving force of trying to suppress the gospel, but it's not the only one. But for those that took what God did and turned it into a lie and blasphemed it, and corrupted what God did and preserved and set up for men so that men can know that God loved them in their sinful state and that He made a way for them to be redeemed. God reserves the fiercest part of His wrath for them. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.